Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Live from the Trevor Zoo. My name is Daniel Cohen. I'm the director of media for the Trevor Zoo, and I'm also a graduate of Millbrook School, a member of the class of 1986. So here at the zoo, I uh, run all of our social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I create content for those things. And I also help uh, operate the live streaming cameras that we have here at the zoo. And I also um, work down in the mill and help run that space. So today we're actually gonna talk about our historic 1862 uh, grist mill. It's the oldest building on the Millbrook School campus. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about the start of Millbrook School. Uh, so this is originally a presentation that I gave to the Millbrook Historical Society a couple of years ago. If you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to type those in the chat. Anyway, let's have a look. Millbrook School was founded in 1931 by headmaster Edward Pulling. That year, the school enrolled their first 21 students. These days, Millbrook graduates about 100 seniors, or sixth formers as we call them, each spring. Our headmaster, Drew Castratano, will be starting his 31st and final year as headmaster in the fall of 2020. That kind of tenure at a boarding school is unheard of in this day and age, and we are incredibly lucky to have benefited from Drew and Linda's dedication and tremendous vision that has guided the school since they arrived in 1990. John Downs from the class of 1998 will be Millbrook's seventh headmaster and will start his tenure in 2021. The school's founding mission was based on five core values and continues that tradition today. Curiosity, respect, integrity, environmental stewardship, and service. Those values are embedded in everything we do. Today, our enrollment is about 320 students across four grades, with students representing 23 states and 17 foreign countries. Most of our 80 faculty members reside on campus where our average class size is 12. We have eight boarding dorms and about 85% of our students live on campus. But all of our day students have a bed. Our campus has grown to 800 acres, is just 90 miles from New York City, and includes a seven acre solar field that powers 100% of our electrical needs. We have 38 athletic teams across 14 sports. Since 1931, our students have participated in an active community service program, now comprising 36 different groups, providing real responsibilities and leadership opportunities. Of course, my favorite community service is the Trevor Zoo, the only zoo in the world located at a high school. The mill is the oldest part of Millbrook's campus. Around 1820, a man named John Leedy dammed up the stream to get water to power a sawmill, which was located just below where our otter enclosure is now located. 40 years later, in 1862, another fellow named William Mosher purchased an acre of land, including the dam and the area just below it, for $300 and got permission to raise the mill dam five feet higher to increase the flow of water through a wooden flume down to this site where he built a new grist mill. The Stanford Glen Mill operated in this building until 1927, when Mr. Joseph Marcy, the last miller, decided to become a farmer. When in operation, the mill ground grain into flour for all the farmers in the neighborhood. Water was directed into the basement of the building, turning a horizontal wheel that was connected to the millstones. The stones, one of which we still have and will soon be displayed outside the front of the building, came from France by sailing ship to Poughkeepsie. The voyage took 87 days, and then the stones were drawn on sleds by oxen to Stamford Glen. By all accounts and some early photographs, the exterior color of the building was originally white. In the 1930s, it was painted red. We returned it to its original color. Edward Pulling was born outside of London, England in 1898, the son of a businessman. His family moved to the United States in 1908, and he attended the Gilman School near Baltimore, and then Princeton University. In 1917, he entered the Royal Navy during World War I. After the war, he got his first teaching job at Groton School, then under the direction of its founder, the Reverend Endicott Peabody. 
Peabody became Pulling's mentor immediately, and much of what he brought to Millbrook he learned and observed at Groton. Peabody's philosophy of education could be summed up in a single remark he made to Pulling on the day they met. Teaching is the imparting of truth through personality. The year was 1920. Pulling furthered his education at Trinity College in Cambridge, England, and then returned to Groton as the head of their history department. In 1928, he married Lucy Leffingwell, and they moved to the newly founded Avon Old Farm School, where Pulling headed their history department. Under Avon's founder, Theodate Pope Riddle, one of the first female architects in the United States, and headmaster Francis Froelicher, Pulling was first exposed to the progressive movement in education, and he would meld that experience with his previous experience of Groton into his own direction of progressive conservatism that he would bring to the founding of Millbrook School. By the time he arrived at Avon, Pulling knew he wanted to start his own school and had been encouraged to do so by many, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then the governor of New York. Pulling had taught FDR's sons while at Groton and had even tutored them in High Park over holidays and breaks. When it came time for Mr. Pulling to look for property to build his school, FDR suggested some land nearby to his house in High Park on Cream Street. He even offered to give Pulling access to the river through his property and to build a boathouse for a crew team. As tempting as that offer was, Pulling didn't like the fact that the main New York-Albany road at the time, this is pre-New York Thruway and pre-Taconic Parkway, was Route 9, which passed directly through the area. He was looking for something a little more isolated. He also felt that being so closely associated with FDR could hurt his prospects of enrolling boys from Republican families. Nevertheless, one of FDR's grandsons attended Millbrook, and Eleanor was a frequent guest and speaker at the school. Mrs. Pulling, Lucy, had been to a wedding some years earlier in Millbrook for her friend Betty Flagler and remembered how impressed she had been by the beauty of the area. The Pullings contacted Betty and were put in touch with a real estate agent who brought them to the Stevenson farm. Upon seeing the property, Ed Pulling knew at once that he had found the spot for his new school. It had everything he was looking for. Approximately 200 acres of farmland, well away from a main road, but close enough to a pleasant village and a railroad station, a pond and streams and farm buildings, including a huge barn with woods and plenty of flat land for playing fields. And somewhat importantly, not very close to a golf course, a favorite hobby of Mr. Pulling, which he knew would take away too much of his time from headmastering if it was very nearby. Instead, he and Lucy often rode their horses for a respite from their work. Betty Flagler was one of three daughters of Henry Harkness Flagler and his wife, Anne. Mr. Flagler was the son of Henry M. Flagler, the American industrialist, a founder of Standard Oil, as well as a developer of the Atlantic coast of Florida and the railway there. Fortunately for Millbrook and the Pullings, Mr. Flagler was more interested in education and music than railroads and oil. Flagler, who was the president of the Philharmonic Symphony Society of New York, was Millbrook's first board president when the school was incorporated in 1932, and he remained the head of the board until his death in June of 1952. Probably no one was more generous in the development of the school and the growth of the campus. The Flagler Memorial Chapel, dedicated to his wife Anne, and designed by the school's architect, Edward Shepard Hewitt, was his crowning gift and completion of the school's western campus, which we now call the Flagler Quad. In the school's library hangs a portrait of Mr. Flagler. Below this portrait reads the inscription, C. Monumentum Requires Circumspice, which translates to, if you need a monument to this person, just look around. Stepping back to 1930, when Ed Pulling arrived on the property, he was presented with the Stevenson Farm, a former dairy farm with barn, a farmhouse, stables, a log cabin, and of course, the mill. Ownership of the land on which the school now stands traded hands many times during the 18th century, but in 1806, it became a dairy farm. The farm continued in operation until the death of its last owner, George Stevenson Sr., 
in 1926. His heirs sold the property in 1928 to Frederick H. Bontecue. As master of the Millbrook Hunt, Mr. Bontecue's intentions were to make the land a hunt club. He already had another farm, now Rally Farm, which Mr. Bontecue liked better than this one. But the oncoming Great Depression and stock market crash of 1929 changed his plans for the hunting club, and he was happy to sell the property to Mr. Pulling. Mr. Bontague became one of Millbrook's great benefactors, and Fred and his wife, Cornelia, became great friends with Ed and Lucy Pulling. Not only did their sons, Fred Jr., class of 1941, and Jesse, class of 44, attend Millbrook, but Fred Sr. became the head of the board after the death of Mr. Flagler. Jesse Bonacue arrived at Millbrook two days after the great New England hurricane of 1938. At least that's what he says, even if his yearbook page says different. He remembers that because he says he spent his first day on campus picking up sticks from the lawn of the headmaster's house. Back then, the school was 7th through 12th grades, as we call them, first formers through sixth form, a British tradition instilled by Mr. Pulling and continued today. Mr. Pulling purchased the 225-acre property in November of 1930 for $130,000. Another $70,000 more was spent for buildings and renovations before the school opened the following year. The bulk of the funding came from Mr. Pulling's father-in-law, Mr. Russell Leffingwell. A New York banker, he joined J.P. Morgan in 1923 and retired as chairman of the company in 1950. The Leffingwell's generosity to Millbrook continued throughout their lives and resulted in many of the buildings on campus. In 1931, the farmhouse became the headmaster's house, as it is still today. The barn became classrooms, as the old cow stalls downstairs were repurposed, and a theater slash gym was housed in the hayloft space upstairs. And a new dorm, South Dorm, now Harris Hall, was built to house those 21 first form boys. Initial tuition cost $1,500, which included everything except laundry. That would amount to about $23,000 today. I can report that tuition is significantly more than that today, but laundry is still not included. Pulling founded Millbrook on the idea of community service, that every boy would make a significant contribution to the life of the school. It was especially true in those early years when the staff was small. They only had two paid people outside of the new faculty, Fritz the maintenance man and George Teffler the school's driver. The students did everything in those days, tended the furnaces, made ice for the hockey rink, and cleaned the buildings. And during World War II, they did even more as most able-bodied men went off to war. By the time the pullings arrived, the grist mill's flume was still here, but in such bad shape it had to be torn down the mill machinery was still here as well, but it was removed to provide space for a furnace to heat the building, which was to become a carpentry shop on the first floor. Fred Blaunstein, a local cabinet maker, taught carpentry in the mill in the 1930s and 40s. And upstairs, an art studio and classroom was created. Artists Grant Renard and Waldemar Neufeld taught classes. Waldemar's son, Larry, graduated from Mobrick in 1967. An accomplished builder, he worked on many projects at the school over the years, including the Trevor Zoo's education building. Of course, the story of the Trevor Zoo is one that would require its own talk, but I'll give you some highlights. In fact, I'll let Edward Pulling tell you the story of its start. My wife and I were having a nice cozy dinner shortly after commencement when a dilapidated old station wagon drew up at the front door. This young man, said, sir, is it true that you're looking for a science teacher? I said, yes, it is. What are your qualifications? Well, he came into the study and never stopped pouring out his abilities, his capabilities and what he wanted to do and so on for, oh, a half an hour. And I was simply overwhelmed. But I had a perfectly clear cut hunch that he was the man I wanted. Then I said, to Frank Trevor, that was the name of this extraordinary young man, would you please tell me what the thunder you got in those crates in that dilapidated old station wagon? He said, they used to be my animals. Tonight, they've become the Millbrook Zoo. Over the subsequent years, the zoo grew along with the school, and Frank Trevor touched the lives and changed the worldview of many Millbrook boys. Mr. Trevor, 
retired a few years after Edward Pulling, who retired in 1965 after 34 years of service. In 1974, John O'Megs from the class of 1965 returned to Millbrook and began a 40-year career of transforming the Trevor Zoo into the nationally recognized institution it is today. In 1989, the zoo received its first accreditation from the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. We now house and breed 10 endangered species and some 180 animals across 80 different species. We welcome more than 40,000 visitors each year, many of them school children visiting their first zoo and seeing exotic animals like lemurs and red pandas for the first time. During the school year, more than 70 Millbrook students work at the zoo every day, feeding and cleaning and caring for the animals. It's a unique life lesson being responsible for other living things that no other high school students can experience in this way, only at Millbrook. After the Holbrook Art Center was opened on campus in 2001, the mill sat mostly unused for many years and was slowly falling apart. Bats and birds inhabited the upstairs, the siding was rotting away, slowly the mill was becoming an eyesore, one which greeted visitors to campus when they first arrived down School Road. Before John O'Megs retired a few years ago, one of his last efforts was to save this building and repurpose it as an entrance for the Trevor Zoo along with the gift shop. After all, it was already on the zoo side of the street. It sounds simple, but it was a battle. There were some who thought it was a waste of time, the school had bigger priorities, and perhaps it would be better to knock the old mill down and be done with it, rather than trying to save a 150-year-old building. But as you can see, clear heads prevailed and the mill was indeed saved. Thanks to the generosity of many, funds were raised and the building was restored. All the beams and floorboards are original and the footprint remains as it was. New walls and windows were installed with modern spray foam insulation, making the building quite warm in the winter and nicely cool in the summer. We burn no fossil fuels. It's all solar powered electricity and very, very efficient. The design and renovation was masterfully done by my friend and Milbert classmate, architect John Ali from the class of 1986. John's firm, Ali Architecture and Design is located in Millerton, New York. The budget was just under $500,000 and construction took about 18 months to complete. To say we are thrilled with the results would be an understatement. As is the case with this building, the zoo is often the beneficiary of our neighbors, many in the Millbrook community who aren't necessarily involved in the life of the school. While Millbrook remains a private institution, the Trevor Zoo is in fact a public space, although it is owned and operated by the school. Frankly, without the support and generosity of our friends and neighbors, we wouldn't be able to accomplish all that we do at the zoo, and we wouldn't be able to continue to grow and evolve. One of Mr. Pulling's challenges in the early years of the school was how to keep on good terms with the school's neighbors, with the prospect of young teenage boys roaming all over their fields. In the fall of 1938, Mr. Pulling received a phone call one evening from his immediate neighbor to the south, Farmer Joseph Marcy. Mr. Poling, he said, one of your boys has been sliding off my hayrick and causing havoc. I won't stand for it. After apologizing as well as he could, Mr. Poling headed over to the dining hall to explain to the students what had happened. He asked the culprit to step forward so he could bring him down to Mr. Marcy's house to apologize in person. To Mr. Poling's relief, the guilty party stepped forward. It was none other than Jesse Bontecue. Off they went to Mr. Marcy's house with Mr. Pulling waiting outside in the car while the farmer berated young Jay for about 10 minutes. Finally, Mrs. Marcy stepped in, said that was enough, and offered Jesse some cider and cookies. Mr. Marcy came out to speak to Mr. Pulling. Let's go down into the cellar, he said. I have some homemade wine I'd like you to sample. Thus began a wonderful friendship between the country farmer and the Cambridge educated educator. Before becoming a farmer, Mr. Marcy had run the old Stanford Glen Grist Mill. He often came up to campus to spin yarns to the boys about the olden days. His schooling never went past the sixth grade, but he was a poet at heart. 
On one visit to campus, he presented Mr. Pulling with the following poem, which he had scrawled on an old Stanford Glen Mill letterhead. For such precious things as these, friendly fields and fruitful years, footsteps turning in the lane to the old mill again. Words that welcome home may know, sun and song and swelling seed, sure supply for every need, for the days that come and go. We thank thee so, O Lord, for the smoke from chimney afar, for the rainbow and the stars, for the busy hands that build the old mill, for each home flower did make. Such precious things as these, for each God aspiring man, for the simple joys of living. Lord, we lift our right hand in glad thanksgiving thoughts to the old mill and miller with candlestick in hand alight to roam across the trails of memory by the old mill stream. So there you go. That's just a little history of the school and the mill. Hope you guys enjoyed watching that. Um, so Mary had a question about when the zoo will be opening. And actually, uh, we're getting that question a lot lately online and on the, on the phone. And uh, it looks like because we're in phase four with zoos and museums in New York State, it'll still be a few weeks, probably the first week of July. Uh, and we're doing a lot to make sure that everyone is going to have a safe, enjoyable experience when they come to the zoo. It'll be a little bit different than it was in the past, but you'll still be able to see all the animals. Um, so if you enjoyed watching this episode, uh, I'd like to just remind you that all of the episodes of Live from the Trevor Zoo are available on YouTube. Uh, and our YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com forward slash Trevor Zoo Millbrook. Uh, you can also check out our live streaming cameras. We have live cameras in our Red Panda exhibit, our lemur exhibit, uh, and on our pond. And you can check those out at millbrook.org uh, forward slash Trevor Zoo Live. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, we appreciate all the support that we've gotten from everybody around the world uh, and uh, around New York State and locally here in Millbrook. Uh, we're going to keep doing these live shows until we open up. Uh, so probably a few more weeks. I think next week we're going to do Red Wolves. So tune in for that. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, be well. Take care. <laughs>